Good morning. You're listening to Drinking Socially, the official untapped podcast. Your inside look into what's happening in the untapped community and the world of beer. I'm John, and while the world has changed, so have we. Uh, but the beers we're featuring on this show are the stuff of legend, the saisons of legend, the farmhouse <laughs> of yesterday. It, Either way, we're excited to share these barometers for the style with you today and introduce John Scholl from the Sister Home program to the show for a segment to talk about the uh, second annual Beer Clean Glass Day. And I'm Harrison, Lights, Camera, Beer. We have got a lot to talk about this week as we've been busy behind the scenes creating cool things to watch online while drinking some beer, which are two things I've really been doing a lot more of recently. So I say we jump right in, but of course, first... As a reminder, Drinking Socially is released every other Wednesday morning and can be found at podcast.untap.com. Or wherever you listen to podcasts. And this is becoming one of my favorite sections of the shows with Harrison. Uh, just kind of catching up. We call it a weekend catch up. But really, Harrison, uh, what have you been doing lately? Uh, any good beers? Any good act- activities you've yeah. been up to? Yeah, absolutely, John. Um, so, I mean, we'll stick with the weekend in true form this this week and actually talk about what happened last Saturday. It was our first Sessionable Saturday is a new segment we're doing here um, at Untapped live uh, across our social media where we're talking with uh, people in the industry about all sorts of things. We had Sam, one of the co-founders of Dogfish Shed, on this past weekend. So that was great. He was on with Greg, co-founder of Untapped, and Todd from Beer Advocate. And they kind of all went back and forth, shared some stories of the past, talked about what's going on now. Uh, drank some really great beers and kind of reminded me first and foremost how really cool Sam is. I was I'm fortunate enough to run into him a couple of times throughout the years and always really nice and had time to talk and answer questions and stuff, which is really cool when you meet someone kind of that big to uh, realize they're not going to you know brush you aside. They're, they have some time to talk and share a beer. Um, and Davos Ed was kind of like that brewery that got me into American craft beer. So anything I'm even remotely involved with by a couple degrees away this time um, with with them, it's exciting. So it's really cool to see the first Sessionable Saturday kickoff. We're doing those at uh, 2.30 Eastern on Saturdays for the foreseeable future, which is really cool to uh, to see what happens next. That's been awesome, Harrison. The whole untapped.tv has been really fun to kind of get to work with Greg and see him spin all that up. Um, but we'll cover more of that after our first beer. Perfect. Otherwise, honestly, I feel like I've been busier than ever working at Untapped to try and yeah. find ways that we can still uh, help out the hospitality <clears throat> industry, the brewers, uh, the people that use us to find beer. Uh, Greg's List is still seeing a lot of web traffic, and it's been a distinct pleasure to see all of the user submissions uh, for updates on there. Keep them coming. I've actually found a couple of Untapped friends uh, that have done some submissions to get uh, – their local bars and, and restaurants updated on Greg's list. So mm-hmm. that's been great uh, and great to see people taking advantage of it. Uh, speaking of which, Harrison, yep. any good beers you've stumbled into since we last kind of got together? Yep, for sure. So still taking advantage of supporting local, also not going, uh, at, you know, just staying at home and drinking those beers. I had our, our local bottle shop drop off another case of beer here this weekend. I'm, I'm really getting, really getting used to that. Um, uh, and, and in that case, among the beers was one from uh, from Burial Beer Company. Rationality shall run its course. Time, I guess you could say. Um, <laughs> or argue is an American IPA with a bunch of hops, Galaxy, Mosaic, El Dorado, Simcoe, a, a lot more. They're using the cryo cow, hops. Yeah. yeah, a lot of cryo hops. They're into that right now. And it was like a big old lactosey New England kind of IP, American IPA hybrid um, where it was definitely bitter, but uh, also cloudy and hazy as, as all get out. So that was um, really fun. Also, another one of um, I've, I'm noticing a lot of breweries on purpose kind of gearing themselves more towards a lot of the sweeter IPAs, which is interesting. And more on the New England side, kind of leaving some re- residual sugars in there when they brew. And it uh, adds to the mouthfeel, but also kind of accentuates the fruity character of uh of those beers that uh, you almost always see in New England. So that was really, that beer was, was one that was a little sweet, uh, sweet, but in a, not a cloying way, in an enjoyable way. It really just kind of brought out the hops and made it really juicy. So Burial knocked it out of the park 
again. John, I saw you dove into the cellar with great success this past weekend. Well, it's always it's always a, a random grab bag when you jump into <laughs> uh, an older cellar anyways. Right. But uh, one of my first favorite stouts uh, was uh, came from Boulevard. And I think it was actually called their X-Series, but it was an imperial mm-hmm. stout they made with coconut added. And nice. it was amazing when I'd first gotten my hands on it. It was a cork and cage 750 milliliter yep, bottle. Yep. Uh, from Boulevard. So, I mean, I, I, like I wanted to save one to see what it would turn into. And then five years went by in a week. Um, so here I was just saying, all right, this is the time we're going to pull it out. I put it in the fridge and I was really surprised. My wife and I got to share it together and the coconut was still there. Nice. It was boozy, but really, really mellowed. Uh, there wasn't much carbonation left in there, I'll admit, but I don't think the taste was affected mm-hmm. It, it maybe it wasn't as good as I remember, but it was. I mean, it's five years in the bottle, right, and right. my my cellar is not a professional kept one. Right. Um, so I was impressed that it made it through. And uh, one of the local bottle shops that does delivery around here got a bunch of beer from Douglas out in Ooh. Sweden. And as far as I'm concerned, they are they're making gold beer, yeah. it, uh, adjunct heavy, mm-hmm. fruited sours, mm-hmm. but um, they've done some amazing amazing beers that's great um so it hasn't been it hasn't been too bad and of course we've got uh john Scholl on the episode uh with us today yeah. here's a quick sound bite from the interview we did with john to talk about uh cicerone's uh beer clean glass day um and of course after that we'll get to our first beer you know this year it's a little bit different obviously uh so what we're saying is you know go visit your favorite you know, watering hole or, or favorite brewery, pick up a beer, pick up some new glassware and, and bring it home and, and pour, uh, clean, clean your glassware and pour it perfectly, um, to celebrate. And then, then send, send a photo, post it on social media. Super excited uh, to play out the rest of that interview for you guys, but more excited, no, maybe equally excited yeah. uh, to talk about this first beer. I kind of view this as, as, as a direct measure for the style of Saison, and I know Harrison's going to get a little nerdy with us, mm-hmm. but tell me uh, tell me about what we're drinking. This was magical. Harrison and I were both able to get two of the same variants of Saison while living in different places, but... Uh, these are pretty widely available, at least uh, for the majority, um, and we hope that you'll be able to find one of these and drink along with us. Yeah, yeah. So when we were talking about what to do this episode, uh, kind of both landed on Saison's, and without even having to ask what should we start with, it was kind of obvious that Saison DuPont is where this conversation should really begin. So we're going to start with that as a beer number one today, obviously from Brasserie DuPont, uh, in Belgium, um, a Saison comes in about 6.5% ABV, about 30 IBUs. And really kind of like the benchmark when you think about Saison, you think about this beer, um, they're really dry. It's highly attenuated, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, bottle condition, which is great. Gives off a nice creamy head. And, and you know, it's a classic kind of estery, different kind of citrusy, spicy beer, although no spice is added. Um creates a really nice full body experience it's it's very refreshing it's it's kind of one of the things i love about these beers is it's they're dry beers also being almost like well they're also fruity beers they're estuary beers it's it's tough to mix like a dry and a fruit thing and and have that be successful uh while also being refreshing and and we're about to taste exactly that though so let's i'm gonna pop mine open and we'll get even deeper into this beer but this is gonna be great I did notice Harrison, yours comes from the in a traditional uh, bottle and cap where right. I was. Uh, I was happy to find a cord and cage seven fifty. Nice. So hopefully the microphone's going to pick this one. Right up here we well. go. Here we go. Ooh, yes. The unfortunate side effect of a cord and cage bottle, if you have dogs, is that generally <laughs> they they have a, a sharp disdain for when you open that bottle. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Mm. And I always love pouring these beers because they're, again, bottle conditioned. So they're, they're re-fermented in the bottle and that can make it pop like you heard John's just now. But also just gives that big old head that kind of just shoots. Even if the beer is really cold, 
Um, it just kind of jumps up to the top of that glass pretty quick, but that's, that's great. That's what you want. That's going to help throw those esters and all the flavor of this beer, the nose of it right up into the room, into your face and kind of start the experience of this beer right there. So perfectly designed. Oh, it's yeah. It's great. I can smell it sitting. I kind of poured it and set it across from me. Right. And John, when we get him on the show, is actually going to talk about, you know, kind of the preferred way to pour beer while you're at home. Yep. Um, but it's it's amazing. My whole early beer life, the head in the beer was viewed as an enemy. And it, mm-hmm. that's that's where a lot of the flavor comes from. Sure. It's like the sauce on your, the gravy on your mashed potato. I'll stop bringing mashed potatoes right. up. The gravy on your chicken fried steak. Yeah. Ooh, there we go. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, CO2 wants to be a gas. It's always trying to escape the liquid it's been forced into. That's why it's called forced carbonation, although this is naturally carbonated um, for the most part. So uh, a little bit of a choice here, I guess, on the CO2's part for existing. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but this is this is amazing. I mean, this is so right away, the nose is right. So S3, meaning kind of like fruity, a little bit of clove happening in there. So there's some, there's definitely some bread right away. And I get like a little spice in the back and a slight kind of like barnyard, just like a one note. And then hmm. the nose on this beer is amazing. And Ooh. it, it fits my stereotypical French assumption of what a beer would taste like. I know Harrison's going to cover a little bit more about the history of the style that this beer reflects. But uh, I think we're starting off with an amazing example the est- the 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 aroma perceives this beer but complements it very well as soon as i take a sip that kind of spiced fruity flavor yeah uh, it's amazing i haven't even gotten a chance to look at it it's so dark in this in this room <laughs> i'm recording in yeah. um it's, it's wonderful it's definitely got some nice haze to it it really for me like the there's so much happening in the nose and you drink it the first flavor i get is the citrus it comes out as just really orangey um mm-hmm. But they're, you know, and obviously there are hops in this beer. Not a lot. It's, um, uh, but there are, I think it's mostly actually East Kent Goldings. I was, uh, if I recall correctly, um, which is like a traditionally a, a UK uh, hop, although it's um, grown all over the world now. But so not like a high alpha acid hop. This is not a hoppy beer, you know, and not a bitter beer. They're in there, but, you know, you, almost today you say it's a citrusy beer and your brain flips over to, like, the last big IPA you had. This is a totally different um, experience when it comes to where the citrus sits, what it's doing. Mm. Mm-hmm. and A different and a, mm-hmm. a, a very refreshing, like, this is, as I understand it, this was a style kind of perpetuated by need of a uh, working in a, in an actual farm field all day long and you want a beer that's going to be robust but refreshing and I, I think this 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 would have rode out well uh sitting up against the low calorie IPAs we did in the last episode yeah it could you're right John that's a good point it's it got a little bit more heat to it it's you know, again six and a half uh ABV but that's right so DuPont's uh, current brewmaster Olivier uh, Nate Eckert, I'm probably saying his name horribly wrong, and it's much more beautiful than that, But so forgive me. But he's a fourth-generation uh, brewmaster uh, for, for Brasserie DuPont. And, yeah, I mean, he shares kind of the history of the style well, where, you know, back in southern Belgium, back in the day, a lot of farms made their own beer in the winter months designed to be enjoyed um, during the harvest or during the planting season, kind of later that year. Um, and so... This beer is kind of a reflection of that, uh, that kind of history of southern Belgium and the beer that we've been brewed for for hundreds of years now, um, kind of bottled it and, and kind of took the best version of it and have been making it for year after year. Like a lot of other Belgian breweries, they, and actually a lot of American breweries now, they reuse the yeast sometimes as long as two plus years. So the same yeast will be repitched again and again, beer after beer, and a generation, so that's called generation. So each time you have a new, you put a new beer on top of a yeast, it's a new generation of yeast, and they tend to get better with age and understand, um, you know, what they're doing more. Quick learning curve, though, you get dumped to a bunch of beer, and and well, at that point, it's it's sugary water essentially, and and that's what you want as a yeast, and then you eat it up, and you're happy as heck, and and kind of figure out how to do that even better and better, and be more efficient. So, um, and they use a really big 
yeast strain to make this, um, which is another way of saying they eat a ton of that sugar, which is why it's very dry. There's not, as I just mentioned about burials beer, I had having a lot of residual sugar in there, sugar that wasn't fermented out. Um, This beer, total opposite. I mean, that's where the dryness is coming from is there is an, as an absence of a lot of the sugar that was there that the beer or the yeast, excuse me, ate and turned into CO2 and alcohol. Um, and yeah, so this is, but again, it's, it's a, it's a, it's the Saison I think about first and to the, at the end about the yeast. So something really unique about Brasserie DuPont is they have these really kind of squat uh, with a flat bottom fermenters they use. Now, most breweries in the world use what are called conical fermenters. See, I'm kind of imagine like a metal ice cream cone almost standing up there full of Perfect. beer, right? Where it's, that's what you're brewing into. And that cone, the cylindrical kind of cone at the bottom helps collect the yeast and allows breweries to easily get rid of it at the right time of the fermentation process where you're not kind of at that point imparting off flavors because it's still sitting on the beer. Well, what they're doing with this this yeast and, and the reason these fermenters are flat is they think it really lets more of that yeast contact, the bit more surface area of the yeast on the bottom, more contact time with the beer itself, imparting more flavor from the really unique yeast they use to the beer and also allowing it to do its job, eat more sugar and do that uh, more efficiently. So they have a really unique brew house that the, the tanks they use, you wouldn't see almost anywhere else as a primary fermentation vessel. They're also really annoying to clean, but when you're kind of repitching again and again for two years at a time on top of the same yeast, don't really need to worry about that. So uh, again, that's something else the beer will take care of itself is kind of, you know, that yeast will make sure nothing else is growing in there that it shouldn't. So it's a really amazing process they're doing to kind of marry that old kind of farmhouse brewing in your backyard or brewing in your grandfather's barn style and something that's really drinkable and is available you know, all over the world. Um, yeah, it's great. I love this style of beer. One of the things I love about this beer is its um, its ability to to kind of go a few different ways when we talk about pairing beer with food. Mm-hmm. The fact that it's got this bold build, but a dry finish yeah. and kind of some spicy, fruity. The first thing that kind of jumps out to me, even though it's a, 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 a created in for France in in seasonal workers beer amazing with asian food or um, like it makes me think of of pairing this along with a pad thai because it would hold up to it and the fruity characteristics i think would play really nice Mm -hmm. to have a saison with something spicy like a pad thai but you could also there's so much nuance to this beer you could get away with pairing this with some poached fish Mm -hmm. um and and something really delicate like that it's not going to overpower as I'm talking through this, I think a Saison may be one of the best beers to pair with with a dinner uh, of food. If we talk about breakfast, I'll take you in a different direction. Right. But uh, there's a lot of versatility in the things you can eat paired up with one of these style of beers. I agree. Yeah, it plays many cards. It's kind of it can. There are wine characteristics to it. There are beer characteristics. There are fruity characteristics to it. So. Yeah, put it next to your cheese and meat plate, put it next to a gumbo, put it next to yeah, something ripe stir fry. Like it's it's gonna sit at different places next to those meals. And right, the mouthfeel on this beer, again, because it's bottle conditioned, it's um it's a little bit bigger. So it's you're gonna um it's gonna be a little more full bodied and that allows it to kind of sit there and and hang with a more spicy dish where other beers may uh may kind of disappear into the background. This one will be right up against it. So one of the questions that comes to my mind every time I think of Saison, they're primarily, when I look at for beers, I primarily see them as, as labeled as a Saison, mm-hmm. but also there's a there's an asterisk or like a follow along that, it, that it's a farmhouse ale as well. Right. Is it, Harrison, can you kind of take a minute and just walk me and hopefully the listeners through uh, is all saisons farmhouse or uh, how's that? What, where's the right. where's the mixture come together? Right. What separates the two? Right. So basically, so there's a, yeah a couple different ways to look at this and a little different perspectives that have changed slightly over time. Where 
Yeah, so that simply put, all saisons are farmhouse ales, but not all farmhouse ales are saisons. Or it's an easy way to kind of think about it, a uh, high level, if you will. Now, when I started brewing about you know commercially, really actually home brewing like ten or eleven years ago, um, it was it was really kind of two different worlds. Uh, in um, the Americanized version of a saison was a farmhouse ale. So it's kind of like an American version of something that was classically French or brewed in Belgium. Um, and then over time, um, what a lot of breweries kind of look at today uh, and approach it today is it's the, say a farmhouse is like an umbrella. So basically, um, yes, it, inc- it can include saisons, but also funkier beers like bearded guards and even gozes, satis, things like that. So it's become a bigger category than just a saison itself. Although a lot of American breweries, and you can really see this on Untapped, how many American breweries are making really great saisons right now. That style itself um, that used to be basically everybody imitating saison Dupont is now have as has as many variations to it as IPAs do, where you have people going very tarty and sour with it. You have people putting it in barrels, brewing it with you know wine must and things like that. Tired hands comes to mind as someone who really pioneered this, as did you know Hill Farmstead and and Side Project Centenarius. So there are lots of breweries that took the idea of a saison that again, I'm going to say pretty much you know Brasserie Dupont kind of brought to the forefront of the world. I mean, they certainly did um, outside of Belgium. This is the most widely available saison out there and the first to really be seen outside of uh, of Europe. Um, I just played along with it, ripped with it. So again, you kind of, depending on you talk to the BJCP, it kind of sees it as an Americanized version of a saison, but a lot of breweries talk about farmhouse ale as the overall a larger category of which a saison is is part of, um, and and it, that's kind of where it lies today, um, which I think is great because it, it just you know you don't want to tradition is great, but not if it kind of hinders exciting innovation, and so that's something I love about this whole entire industry is there will always be people saying, you know, hazy IPAs, uh, much of, what a bunch of garbage. Uh, but most people aren't saying that. Most people are riding the, t- you know, g- we're going along with the times and realizing this is exciting and cool and there's merit to it and something to be discovered here. Same with Saison's. It, it was forever kind of like a guarded style, but now it's just as exciting as any other style out there because, you know, really every brewery does it differently. Um, but yeah, it's 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 been cool to see that uh, see that evolution happen, and really kind of I was really brewing when it was all kind of happening. I was there the first day, tired hands opened. I was there in the door, walked right in, had a beer they haven't brewed since called Frip, which was the best bitter. It was amazing. Um, it's like a four percent uh, ABP best bitter, and he had a bunch of his saisons on. He had saison hands on, which was called something else. Then what was it called? farm hands or something like that. It was great. Um, yeah. So that was the first two birds I had from them, um, from uh, tired hands. And uh, they, again, they're one of the ones you really think about when you're talking about, uh, breweries in these States that are doing something cool with saisons. I, uh, I've never been so fortunate to visit tired hands, but my <laughs> wife did order a glass from there their go. online store. Um, it's a beautiful glass. She actually saw a picture someone shared in the Facebook group, uh, using that glass and uh, and kind of chased it right, down. Right, great artwork. I know. Yeah, that was. I didn't mean to name drop there, but that was that was a that was a. Ha- if only I'd known kind of what that would have become. Uh, you know, I just walked into a new brewery and and was like, "Hey, I saw you guys doing something cool." Uh, and I live down the street. Uh, I'll have a panini. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the way it always it often goes? Right, no one knows. Uh, you don't usually you don't understand when 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 side project is mm-hmm. opening up in your backyard like right. it you go in there you meet the brewers it's a small operation mm-hmm. you fall in love with their beer then you realize like you've you've been lucky because most of the world is trying to get it and yeah. you're just living in that in, in, in right. that area of the world. Right. I'm going to use that to kind of segue really quick into some of the social media moves that Untapped has been oh, yeah. making. 
Um, not that uh, some, I, I, like, not not because we've just been resting on our hands, but largely because I think we finally had the time or the bandwidth to dedicate to uh, expanding our own social media. And we've been fortunate that uh, Greg Avola has been able to kind of pivot and and help spin up a lot of the new um, ideas, for lack of a better term. You might, if you follow us on social if you've uh, instagram twitter facebook you've probably seen uh we started to launch like untapped trivia tuesdays and mm-hmm. we did a way back wednesday right. the of course the virtual happy hours are on thursday uh we just last week did one with danny connors from rogue ales got to kind of talk with him um there's usually at the this or that Fridays. That's kind of how we uh, that influenced this show. We asked, you know, would you rather have a Saison or a Blonde? And it was close for a while, but Saison was the winner. Oh. Uh, so that kind of that that's helped us decide on these beers. Um, and of course, Harrison mentioned Sessionable Saturdays. Uh, where Sam Calgioni was on the inaugural one. And the great part about those is it gives us an opportunity to do something around 2, 2.30 Eastern, where mm-hmm. if you're in London, if you're in the Netherlands, it's not too late in the day for you. And if you're in California, it's not too <laughs> early. It's pretty uh, early, but no. uh, but it's not as obligating to drink a beer like a happy hour. Or so, um, And it was great to see not just Greg, but Todd Allstrom from Beer Advocate and Sam Calagione, like some of the people that shaped beer Mm -hmm. all on a call together. The other thing I want to draw some attention to in regards to social media is uh, untapped.tv. It's kind of, it's it's all wrapped up at the Untapped at Home venue, which has now got over 3 million beers checked in there. Um, I'm going to quiz Harrison on some numbers here in a minute. But the idea with untapped.tv is if you missed the Sam Calagione interview, if you missed a virtual happy hour, they're all recorded and stored on there. So you can head to untapped.tv and watch one of the happy hours from before. You can subscribe to Untapped at Home and you'll get a push notification when these events are going live. And of course, we hope to roll out some more uh, kind of exciting and fun ideas as well. Let's get to the numbers. That's where I live and breathe most of the time. We talked about 3 million check-ins at home. Uh, The first question I want to ask Harrison is, what do you think the top checked-in beer? We talked about it on the last episode. Um, And if I remember, I should have checked my notes. I think it was Guinness. But um, there's been some new beers released. Uh, What do you think the top checked-in beer has been over the last couple of weeks? I'm going to guess that one of them, knowing the time of year it is and uh an important day that just happened uh stone and joy buys 420 been seeing that checked in just a ton over across on tap did that crack the top three there john all right it's not even fair man <laughs> um stone, stones and joy by 420 is the most checked in beer yeah. at the home venue um it's followed pretty close by founders new release unraveled ipa nice. And Bell's just released Oberon. I think it's it's not quite available nationwide yet, so I expect yeah. to see Oberon climb yeah. maybe in the next episode. Sure. The weather um, warms up a bit. Yeah, it's climbing up the charts for sure. And then um, another another uh, bit, I don't mean to throw anyone under the bus, but we've got three million check-ins at the <laughs> at-home venue. Um, and I'm going to give some shout-outs to the top three uh, people. Yes. Uh, and I, I can't... I, there had to have been some kind of porting or adjusting. Hopefully, maybe not. Uh, we'll oh, find out. I hope so. Harrison, that being said, um, at the Untapped at Home venue, who do you, what, what number are you looking for to say maybe is like the leaderboard of who has the most check-ins there? Wow. Let me see. So how many weeks have we been doing this now? Has it been four weeks about or a little more than – We've had it up for yeah, I mean, about around if now. time is still relevant. Sure, yeah, right. Who's I'm counting? Say it's right. been weeks. It's, it's been close to four four weeks at this point. Right. It's an accurate sure. assumption. No one will know. No one knows. So I'm going to guess. I mean, I mean, a, a logical guess would be like if I'm having, I don't know, two or three beer, like two or three beers a night. I'm having 30, 40, like fifty or sixty. Is that is that is that? Although you did allude to people moving stuff over. So I'm, I wonder if people are retroactively changing their houses to untapped at home or something like that. So 
I, I have, to, I, ha- I hope so. If not, I really want to hear from them. Right. Um, but I'll give you the top three in reverse order. So representing the United States okay. is Christopher K. Nice. Uh, from uh, is, uh, the home state of Virginia. Okay. Christopher K. has checked in 883 Whoa beers uh at the at home venue and that's where i assume if you've been an untapped user for a while you've probably checked in at your own house apartment and then you just move those check-ins to untapped at home Ooh. it would be really difficult that's uh i don't have i can't do the math on me right now but yeah. that is a lot of beers per day a lot of beer and his closest competition, uh, number two, is Johannes from Sweden. He's 889, so he's Ooh. only six beers ahead of, uh, of our representative from the United States. But number one, Peter, uh, out of the U.K., Liverpool specifically, uh. 1,100 or more uh, <laughs> check-ins. So, uh, Peter, that's amazing. If you're a, if you can if you're listening, send us a message. Let us know. Uh, let right. us know what you're doing. You doing? Uh, we'd we'd love to talk to you about what you're drinking. Right. You probably earned the London Pride part of the badge like a thousand times. If I had to guess, could have could have. <laughs> London Pride is still the number one beer. Uh, for those of you that have earned the Drink and Socially badge. I don't know if we'll be able to find a beer that gets more than London Pride, but uh, number two is uh, Old Rasputin, so one of the more recent ones, but it's really cool to see people enjoying that beer as well. So that's good. And, and of course, most of uh, these stats, Greg also does kind of roll through really quickly when he does a virtual happy hour. Check it out on YouTube if the last bit of social media talking and then we'll cut to a break, uh, all of the Drinking Socially episodes were always posted on the Drinking Socially YouTube channel. Uh, one of the benefits of spinning up our own social media is that Untapped now has a social media channel or a channel on YouTube. So going forward, if you just subscribe to the Untapped YouTube channel, you'll be able to get the most recent uh, podcast episodes on there as well. Um, And as soon as Harrison and I are able to release some video with that, that's going to be the first place you'll be able to see him. Yep. That is in the works. We're teasing a little bit, but that is something we were actively putting some time and an effort into. All right, cool. Well, John's going to fill us in on your favorite sponsor this week for a moment. And we'll jump in with uh, John Joel from uh, Cicerone Program. And as you, you venture into the untapped store, keep an eye out. We do have those flight tasters and the available. I know people are asking about it. So they're they're in there, um, which is pretty cool. So check that out and, and listen to John. I'll tell you to uh, get it for a little bit less, too. Want to show off your love of Untapped? Check out our online store and pick up Untapped branded glassware, shirts, sweatshirts, hats, more. Depending on how hot or cold you are, go to store.untapped.com and enter the coupon code podcast when you check out. That'll get 20% off anything you order. That's store.untapped.com. Use the coupon code podcast, 20% off for you. Plus, it lets them know that you guys are listening and we love that here. Thanks again for mentioning the flight glasses, Harrison. Mm-hmm. I know Jared was talking about them in the social media and uh, the Facebook group as well. Um, coming up, uh, we're featuring John Scholl from uh, the Cicerone program. He serves on the, as their marketing manager for Cicerone. And if you're not familiar, Cicerone's been around for about 12 years now. They launched in 2008 by a brewer slash author slash beer educator, Ray Daniels. I think Harrison's actually read some of his books. Mm -hmm. The Cicerone program, uh, the goal is that it kind of um, educates consumers to make sure that they're receiving the best quality beer and service uh, whenever they go out. So they do this by focusing on five key ingredients, uh, which is uh, keeping and serving the beer well, uh, knowing the difference in beer styles, being able to understand beer flavor and evaluate that, mm-hmm. uh, the ingredients and the brewing process behind making the beer. And the fifth one is actually pairing it with food. So if you're fortunate enough to visit an establishment that employs Cicerones, the idea is you'll be able to get a better experience or learn more about the beers. So with that being said, uh, we're going to welcome John Scholl to the program. Harrison's got an awesome interview segment lined up with him. Uh, 
Uh, John, welcome to the show. Uh, I know Harrison's got some questions lined up for you, but thanks for taking the time out to join us today, man. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me, John and Harrison. Excited to be here. Uh, excited to talk about Beer Clean Glass Day. Um, you know, it's actually our, our second year of having this. Last year was the inaugural year. Uh, nice. So it was pretty successful then. Um, it was a worldwide event. And, you know, we're trying to make it larger than life. Um, more than Cicerone, as a matter of fact, um, made it like an IPA day or stout day and have everybody uh, take part of it. That's right. Yeah, it's hard to drink beer without a glass, but obviously you have cans and bottles and you could drink right from the tap if it's the appropriate time of day, I guess, or appropriate day of the year. Um, but most of the time you're pouring it or having it in a, in a glass. So it's, I'm pumped that uh, yeah, we're taking some time to focus on that. And, and really before we get into the nitty and gritty of actual beer clean glass a day, Love to kind of quickly hear from you, John, kind of about what you do uh, and kind of what a little bit more about like the Cicerone program itself, what your, your role there is. Though. So my role at Cicerone is I'm the marketing manager. I started in 2016. Uh, I have a background in, in media, um, you know, working in radio, outdoor, big multinational companies, had to wear a tie to work every day. And during those times, I had a big passion for for beer and food um we, me and a couple buddies were doing pop-up grilling events around chicago um which led in in weird routes but we eventually uh wrote a cookbook um i was home brewing growing hops in my backyard and um you know during this time i became a certified beer server with the cicerone program uh that was about t- 2014 uh because i wanted to make my beer reviews a little bit more legit uh, than what they were. And, uh, you know, once I was perusing LinkedIn and saw a job there open up and I said, you know what, I want to work with Ray Daniels and I believe in the Cicerone program. And I went for the job and I got it. That being said, I am a little disappointed that I didn't study harder for my certified beer server exam, having known what I, that I would be working for the company in 2016 when I took the exam in 2014, I probably would have studied much harder and got a right. better score. <laughs> <laughs> Hindsight 2020, right? That's yep. uh, that, that's amazing. Of course, Ray Daniels is kind of a legend in the the beer world. So, I mean, yeah, it's easy to see why you'd want to work with him. I mean, he literally wrote the book on brown nails, which is as all the all the listeners know or should know by now. So, John and I both, uh, so we both love. So that's. Um, Pretty cool, among other you know great things to uh, that that raised up, and that's one that always jumps out to me when I think about him. I think about brown ales and 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 uh, and get all warm and fuzzy inside. Uh, all right, cool. So the twenty fifth of April, John. So why is this kind of the day to focus on clean glassware and and kind of uh, adding on to that? What was kind of the thought behind you know propelling this idea forward and making it really an initiative and a focus of uh, Cicerone? Well, you know, I think the the fourth saturday of every april is is when beer clean glass day is going to be so it, it'll it'll change from from year to year um and this year it's on the 25th and really the reason why uh you know we selected this date was in chicago it's kind of the time when people are finally starting to come out of hibernation mm. uh, not that we weren't going to bars a lot when when it's cold out um but you know we're starting to hit patio season and just the way like the sun and and the light hits like a perfectly poured beer in a beer clean glass. It's something of beauty and something to celebrate. Um, and it's kind of getting into that whole season where you're drinking outside during the summer. You're having backyard barbecues. You're you're you know having brunches on on sidewalks in the city. And you know it's it's a way that we we wanted to celebrate and we wanted to celebrate you know not only proper beer service but those retail accounts those accounts those bars and restaurants who are providing that to their customers. So really it's kind of like a big cheers to, to them. Um, you know, this year it's a little bit different, obviously. Uh, so what we're saying is, you know, go visit your favorite, you know, watering hole or, or favorite brewery, pick up a beer, pick up some new glassware and, and bring it home and, and pour, uh, clean, clean your glassware and pour it perfectly um, to celebrate and then then send send a photo post it on social media hashtag beer clean glass day and um you know we'll we'll give you a little bit of love if we uh come across it that's fantastic so it sounds like and this is probably obvious but it's kind of part of your education and becoming a cicerone 
clean glassware, glassware overall. Is that like a pretty big focus? You know, it's essentially like beer fundamentals 101. Um, you know, treating beer well means that the customer or your experience is, is going to be good. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and one of the big pushes is like, as customers and, and drinkers just in general become more knowledgeable, um, you know, like thanks to what Untap's doing, uh, with your rating system, you know, it, 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 you guys keep evolving and, and forcing users to educate themselves more. Um, you know, those serving the beer need to be a step ahead. And everything kind of boils down to serving beer in a clean glass. So, so when, you go to a, a, when you go somewhere that has a perfectly poured pint in a beer clean glass, you can probably bet that they're also taking good care of beer in the cooler and then through their wholesaler and, and right. all the way up the chain. That way, when it hits the glass, it's as the brewer intended. Um, and that really, that's the, the best way to, to explain it. Like a lot can go wrong from when beer leaves the brewery doors to when it hits your glass. And the right. most telltale sign is seeing little bubbles cascading up the side or right. lipstick on the glass. And, and you know, like, all right, well, mm-hmm. Maybe this, maybe this establishment isn't taking the best care of their beer. Like, what else are they doing down in the cellar? So, you know, it's right. just one of those things that's completely obvious um, if you understand what, what to look for. Um, right. You know, personally, like, before I joined the Cicerone team, like, I was serving beer and dirty glassware. I was drinking beer and dirty glassware just because right. I didn't know. And you don't know what you don't know. And then once... Um, you know, it was explained to me like, oh, these are signs of like dirt on glasses. It was like, oh, I can't unsee that now. Right. You got it right. If you look behind the curtain, you can't unknow <laughs> yeah, exactly. who the wizard actually is. That's very true. And that's a great kind of, uh, I guess, a, a reference point. The cleanliness, the glass kind of reflects a lot of the the rest of that business. We used to say in the when I worked in bars and restaurants, you kind of judge a, a bar or restaurant by how clean their bathroom is or by how well they make a cheeseburger. Like if they can do that, great, then that's kind of the baseline you can judge a lot of other things from. And that's I'm going to add clean beer glass is a, kind of something I'm looking for. Not that I wasn't, but it's kind of a, like a keystone, something where you see that and you go, all right, that says more than a clean glass. It's telling a longer story. And I think that's something everyone can do. And if you haven't yet, now you know kind of why and what and why to look for it and what to look for. That's um, that's awesome. So in kind of part of that, the training and learned about all this stuff, we do come across or do you guys have like some best, met, best methods, like essential steps for both, you know, bar and restaurant and brewery owners, but also people at home to kind of do to make sure they have clean glassware? Yeah. So I think, you know, this year we're really focusing on on drinking beer at home to celebrate this. Uh, so Neil Witte, who's a master Cicerone, uh, he wrote for us a, a a blog about like best practices for for home drinking. Um, you know, and just a, a quick kind of outline of of what you can do is is clean your glasses by hand with a soft brush. So, you know, you could get a, a brush from Amazon that's specifically for glassware. It has a little suction cup. It, it goes on the bottom of your sink. Or, you know, if anybody has kids, you probably have an extra bottle brush laying around. It could have been on right, your sink right. for a while. Just make sure it's really clean. That's an awesome tip. I yep. love that. Yep. Yeah. You know, bottle brushes are, are perfect to clean your glassware. Um, so use the second step is always use a detergent uh, designed for cleaning glassware. Uh, so there's a couple uh, companies out there. One is called Beer Clean uh, Glass Cleaner. Um, you can get it on, you know, most big retail stores. Uh, another that we prefer is called TDC detergent. Um, and it, it comes in a mm-hmm. liquid and powder form. And really like that just makes your glasses sparkle and shine. And, and you'll get that lacing and, and head retention and everything else that you want uh, at home if you use that detergent. Um, and the third thing is to let your glasses air dry. Um, you know, when you start going and, and rubbing them dry, you can get lint, uh, oil, dirt, whatever it may be from your hands or from whatever that cloth was that you're cleaning uh, previously into your glass. Uh, So, you know, I would say get like a little mat um, that's raised. If you have like a 
a, a thing that you cool your cookies on or, or, mm -hmm. or bread on uh, after you cook it, just put your glasses on it upside down after it's cooled off, obviously, and uh, let those drip dry and, and you should be uh, ready to roll with a, a, a nice looking beer when you finally pour something in it. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's an awesome point. I never really thought about, John, but essentially the same dish detergent that I use to do the dishes with is giving me a, a, a bad beer pour effectively. Is that, can I break it down like that? Yeah. Right. And, and a lot of those is because it's like a fat glycerin type base, uh, which is going to coat your, your glass. Like it's the glass is not going to be dirty. So there's a difference between like a dirty glass, a clean glass, and then there's the beer clean glass. And when I say beer clean glass, like, I mean, you're going the extra step to, to ensure that you do get like the head fermentation or the head uh, retention and then the lacing forming. Um, and, and if you clean at home, like if you put it in a dishwasher or if you put it in, uh, use dish detergent to, to clean it, what's happening is you're, you're coating it with something else that's going to make it look nice and shiny. But in reality, it's, it's going to kill anything that's, you know, the, the head retention, it's, it's going to kill that. It's not going to stay. So it's going to, you know, just lessen the experience a little bit. And you also can get the chance of, um, you know, bubbles clinging to the side. Uh, you know, what we always say is uh, beer doesn't stick to glass. Uh, bubbles don't stick to glass. Bubbles stick to dirt. So when you have a nucleation point on the side, that's some kind of grease. And it could just be from your dish, dish, dish detergent or a fingerprint when you're pouring or, or something like that. It doesn't mean it's unsanitary per se, but uh, again, we want to respect the beer and drink it um, like the brewer wants us to drink it. And uh, the clean glass is, is the way to go for it. All right. Awesome. So yeah, now we're I said pouring more beer at home. Is there a, like a good way or preferred method from pouring out of a, a crowler, a growler, a can, a bottle that you guys kind of recommend or you yourself kind of follow? Yeah. And, and really it's, it's similar to, to pouring out of a draft. Um, instead of opening up a faucet, you're opening up a can or bottle. Um, but it's uh, tilting the glass at a 45 degree angle, letting the beer uh, hit probably the glass about two thirds of the way up and then, and then kind of flowing down towards the bottom. And as you near the top, you, you start to uh, position the glass more upright. Um, I typically say about three quarters of the way up for uh, beers that are not nitro, um, start, start moving that up. And then uh, by the end, the final uh, one quarter of the beer, you're pouring straight down the middle to, to form that head and really start to like, you know, get that uh, carbonation out of, out of uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Suspension, <laughs> knock it out there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Look, yeah. Look, yeah. Knock, knock, knock the carbonation out a little bit. So that's you can right. really start to, to get that aroma and everything else that's mm -hmm. included with a, a beer experience. For those of you that are listening to this, I, I regret like John does such a great job of pantomiming <laughs> how to pour those <laughs> beers. It like, as I was watching, it made me want to pour one. <laughs> right. um, I want to throw a wrench at you, John, and ask, uh, if it's if it's a nitro beer in a can, if I'm fortunate enough to have one laying around, do you have any tips for how you might pour those a little bit differently? Well, it, it depends on the nitro. If it's um, you know force carbonated, um, you know I think Left Hand Brewery kind of coined the term "pour hard," so straight out of the glass, upright, straight down, kind of shake it as it comes out. Um, if it's a widget beer, uh, the the way you pour it is is similar, but ex before you go to three quarters of the way full, um, so you're still holding the glass at 45 degree angles, you pour about two thirds of the way down, put that glass uh, upright, and then and then finish pouring down the middle. That way you can really get the cascading effect and like a nice thick head that's going to leave a mustache on you, you know, when you take your first step. Because <laughs> that's, that's what you want. You want to have the, the, the beer dip on your, uh, you know, on your mustache after you after you sip. Kind of, yeah, I live for that every day uh, <laughs> when I can. That, that's awesome. So, so as of today, how many people about are, are kind of out there as either – we could say just kind of beer server levels he's their own or above. What? How many about um, active? So all in, uh, we have close to 130,000 people uh, worldwide right. that have been through our program. So yeah. we're in um, multiple languages. So our most recent translation was was Chinese. Um, we have uh, translations in, in Korean, 
uh, Spanish for Latin America and Spain, Dutch, uh, Portuguese. I'm probably forgetting some others. And then, and then a couple different versions of our syllabus, uh, depending on where you are in the world, uh, in, in English. So uh, French is the other one that I was forgetting. So, you know, we are, uh, have become in, in the last, you know, 12 years that we've been around kind of the, um, flagship of, of certification for the beer industry, for the service side, you know, obviously there's, yeah. you know, great brewing schools out there and, uh, you know, we're not, we're not saying that we're a brewing school. We're more focused on, uh, proper service and handling. So brewing school teaches you everything to do at the brewery. Mm-hmm. And once the beer leaves the door, we teach people, you know, what happens after that all the way down to, you know, the customer actually getting the beer in their hand. So the, the whole supply chain and, and then food and beer pairing and, um, you know, things like that. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah. Wow. So it sounds like, you know, if I wanted to become a CSRO and if our listeners wanted to do it, they can kind of do that from anywhere in the world. Is that right? How do you kind of get started on this path? Is it something that they're finding passion for and check it out? Yeah. So our first level exam uh, is called the Certified Beer Server, and that's an online exam. Um, again, that's that, that fundamental, like the beer clean glass or how to properly mm-hmm. pour. So it covers the fundamentals. And it's if you're working in beer, drinking beer, dealing with beer, the, these are things that you should know. Um, right. And we, we test on that. Um, after that, um, you know, the exams are in person. And depending on where you are in the world, uh, we have proctors all over the world at this point um, for certified Cicerone. And um, like I said earlier, in multiple languages. So, uh, you know, we do have rotating exams. We do about 200 a year throughout the world at this point. Um, and then after that, the advanced Cicerone and master Cicerone are pretty much strictly North America uh, at this point. Um, but if there's demand, uh, we'll go. Um, uh, again, the first level is, is available at any time anywhere in the world uh, because it's online at cicerone.org. Yeah. Fantastic. And we'll definitely have links to that in the show notes as well. John, thanks so much for joining us and kind of giving us a good explanation of not only just uh, what is a beer clean glass, but uh, some of the resources behind your team that puts stuff like this together. Um, and hopefully those of us that are drinking from home might have a new hobby or at least try and perfect the art. Right. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. And, you know, I, I forgot to ask you guys, what are you drinking right now? The perpetual. B-roll. Right. right the, <laughs> the, yeah. The, the ultimate question. So I have, uh, what do I have? I have Edward Teaches Session IPA, their local brewery to us just in, in Wilmington here. It's great. It's kind of, it's, I mean, it's, I love it. It's like a very great go-to beer that I'd grab a four pack of the other day, but they're uh, pretty close to our office. Um, yeah, that's why I'm having just some, something simple before these Saison, jump on the Saison train. <laughs> Clean the palate with something else sure, before you sure. get on the Saison train. <laughs> right. I am not doing that. I am drinking cereal for dinner from Eddie's <laughs> oh, Toast. Oh, yeah. oh, I saw they did. We just got some. <laughs> I think it's almond, vanilla, uh, almonds, vanilla, lactose, and a blonde ale, yeah. if I remember wow, correctly. Crazy. It tastes like cereal. The crazy. Milk for dinner. Um, you as well are drinking a beer over there. John, care to share? Yeah, I have a uh, fader uh, from Half Acre. It was released Ooh. last Friday. And it's just like a, a lager. It's a simple, like, German pills that, you know, it's, it's pills or malt. Uh, they might have a little Vienna in there and then noble hops. Um, mm-hmm. I think they might've dry hopped, uh, with noble hops and it's just solid. It's one of my favorite, like I, I had it last summer just on draft. And then I, I had it again, uh, right as I picked it up. Um, and it might be like my, you know, deserted Island, uh, beer for, yeah. for a lager. Uh, I just, I love it so much. So I, I have a new summer beer, I think. <laughs> That's good to find that now. Yeah, exactly. Wow, what an awesome guy. That was that was a blast talking with him. Uh, fortunately, we got to share a virtual pint with him. Hope to have a, a physical pint with him soon, maybe at Half Acre. I mean, I missed those beers. Uh, it's pretty cool. He was uh, he is that close, able to grab them uh, 
whatever it was, maybe miss it even more. So I'd love to do that in person uh, in one day. But right now, actually, Don and I have another beer to share together. So let's let's get to that. Beer number two is, well, actually, I'm going to open up this one. John, do you want to run us through the quick quick notes about beer number two for today? Totally wouldn't mind. This one, um, this is more the Saison I'm used to. Uh, so this one's brewed from Allagash Brewing up in Maine. Um, and one cool side note is that Harrison actually took me through a virtual tour of Allagash through YouTube recently, which was really uh, kind of a, a stay-at-home fun project. Mm-hmm. But to the beer, um, this is called Saison from Allagash. And it is 6.1% ABV. The notes they provide for us on Untapped tell us this is a main interpretation of a classic Belgian farmhouse style ale. Uh, notes of citrus and peppery spice accompany the pleasant malt character and a tropical aroma. The addition of dark Belgian candy sugar uh, complements the beer's rustic flavor while giving it a dry palate. And in my opinion, mm-hmm. this one is amazing. Um, so I see Harrison's got it in his cup. Mm-hmm. You may know Allagash from Allagash White. Uh, if you're into it, you may know Allagash Curio. That's a that's a big mm-hmm. uh, Belgian triple oh, that's barrel aged. So I love. That's uh, that's like the Allagash version of Dark Lord. Mm-hmm. I know they do many other amazing beers, but Curio always gets a nod from me. Um, so let's get to the Saison. Let's try this one, and especially I want to kind of hear, Harrison, how you think this compares to DuPont. Not that one's better or worse, but how are sure. they different? Sure, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, that's kind of right, The again, to what I was talking about before, about the history of Saisons and where they came from and where we are now and, and all that that good stuff. I mean, right away, obviously they're, they know their beer well, no surprise there, but the tropical, it is very tropical. It's, it's not one, it's not one citrus note. It's actually like a, a lot of different fruit happening. There's like a little bit of banana in there. There's some fresh strawberries. There's all kinds of cool stuff. Some stone fruits too going on right away in the nose. Um, it's a fluffy head as well. They bottle condition their beers at, uh, Allagash too, which is which is fantastic, um, and it's not quite as dry um, as saison Dupont, but, but definitely get that kind of peppery spice, but a lot of fruit coming through in a couple of different ways, which is which is great, mm, man. But it's that same that kind of like right that peppery characteristic where it's kind of the as you drink it, it starts out so fruity and that it kind of peppers out almost into like this, this dryness that once makes you want to have another sip, almost like how a very bitter IPA works to kind of invite you back again. These beers are the perfect, you know, perfect, whatever realizations of, you know, how do you move a product quickly? Well, let's make each sip you take, make you want to drink more of it. So there's just this never ending cycle, this snake eating its tail, except uh, (laughs) you're the, snake and the beer is the tail or i don't know who's the what but this is this is it's great it really you know i know you hear that a lot and you can kind of uh tasty notes of how it, it invites another sip but it really does um where it's and again that's part of that refreshing nature of it yeah i, I couldn't agree with that more the um saison dupont poured i got a much better head from that yeah. i was pouring it out of a cork and cage right. as well this comes from a, a, a 12 ounce b- bottle but the aroma is different. The mm-hmm. taste is if we do this so often when we drink two similar beers on the show, I'm always amazed at how different right. they are, sure. even though they have, both have the same stats. Sure. But it's re- this is remarkable mm-hmm. how di- if I could if I could summarize the whole taste experience, it's not orange, right. it's not pepper, but it's it's the orange right. peel. The like orange you peel, have yes. that. Yes, yes, exactly. That's it. Right, it is. It's more orange rind than it is like whole orange. That's a great way of looking at it. Um, yeah, I totally agree. And on Untap itself, so this is a now it's I believe it's a now it's a pretty much a flagship saison is for Allagash. I think it's available almost everywhere that Allagash White is available, and it's available all year, uh, which is really cool. At seventy four thousand total check ins, fifty nine thousand unique, uh, eighty nine this month. Although I'm sure that'll start to pop up as it gets a little bit warmer out. And this this beer, you know, is a uh, is kind of like a I won't say imperial, but it's a uh, you know last episode we did light as John referenced like light session IPAs, if you will. This is going to be a bigger 
bigger beer, but it it's still I could see myself having one of these after mowing the lawn and being just as satisfied. Um, which again, what's what they're designed for to be kind of, you know, you're working the fields all day, planting wheat or whatever you're doing, making bread, chasing goats. And then you want to come inside and kick your feet up and have something refreshing. And this is the beer that'll, that'll do that just kind of a couple, uh, hundred years ago. Um, and now still today, but it's, uh, yeah, you know, everything Allagash does is so, so well done. You know, I, I recently added Allagash White to my my Mountain Beer more with good reason, and talked about kind of the 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 vision that Rob Todd has, uh, the founder of Allagash. And obviously, I'm a huge fan. But then this beer is another just reminder of um, again in the in the day of IPA, pause and and visit what places like Allagash are doing because it's it's one thing to say you're kind of keeping a tradition alive. It's something entirely different to say you're kind of iterating on that and making it your own while, um, you know, making something interesting as, as you're honoring the past. That's what they do kind of flawlessly without making it kind of a gimmick. It's really, it's really great. Um, and, uh, I was lucky growing up in the Northeast to see this all the time. This, this beer is newer, but it's the Allagash all the time. Um, and yeah, every time I get a chance to drink something else from them, I'm always excited because that's going to be so well made and, it's tough to wrangle these beers and these yeasts and kind of have them do what you want them to do. It's, it's not the easiest thing. So they, but they always manage to, to succeed. It's, it's impressive. It's yeah, as I'm drinking this one, it's, um, it's, it's much more sessionable. It's, uh, um, it, uh, this this is one I could go through a, a four or five mm-hmm. six pack without without even trying or thinking about yep. it and and as you said Harrison it it's built for the style but I think what's what's so magical is if we if we say that Dupont is kind of the barometer for what the saison was a hundred years ago yeah. and you see what Allagash has done and kind of put their spin on it but you can clearly without even trying you can kind of draw a line to the relation of like. You, I can I can see the I can taste the the influence from Cezanne Dupont in this beer. Mm-hmm. It's just subtly different. Sure. Um, yeah. And and you're right. Almost everything Allagash puts together uh, has has been brilliant. Yeah. Do you know if these guys have these guys ever like talked or met each other or, or done a beer together right. at all? What a great question, John. So yeah, we're not the only ones in the room that have realized that these two breweries have are kind of kindred spirits. Allagash and Brasserie Dupont kind of saw that in them, each other as well. So about a year ago in uh, March of 2019, they released Brewers Bridge, which is a collaboration between Brasserie Dupont and Allagash, um, where they made like a classic saison. But the twist was so they're using kind of the the time honor Belgian brewing techniques, combining the uh, American hops with it, and a little bit of craft brewing innovation. So. Um, made a beer together um about a year ago uh that's listed as a, a farmhouse uh a saison on on untapped about thirteen thousand um total check-ins uh about 107 this month so more than than uh saison by allagash itself which is pretty cool one that i didn't get my hands on although um i see there are a couple verified venues not too far away from me that still have it so that might be i mean it certainly will be next on my list next order i put together pop it on there and kind of with my re- remaining bottles of Brasserie Dupont Saison and um, Allagash Saison, pop this in the middle and kind of see what happens. But yeah, they're, um, I mean, that's a r- really cool collaboration. It's one that I want to, I definitely want to check out and I didn't even know about it until kind of talking about today's episode. So it's on my radar, look it up on a tab. I mean, I see it about three verified venues within a couple miles of me. So uh, I will definitely be yeah be be enjoying that soon, and hopefully report back on it when we catch up uh, on next weekend update. What uh, as you mentioned that I immediately went to Untap to look for it and see have I had this before? Um, no, the answer is a clear and present no. <laughs> um, but what was really cool is I always check to see what one what of how many of my friends have had right. a beer when I look at it on Untapped and. Uh, one of my friends that works at the bottle shop that does the beer delivery, he had that beer just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that's really cool to see. And another friend in Russia is <laughs> drinking that beer out of that's a amazing. victory art glass. And they made the the Ivan beer we Ooh, had with the Russian stout. So yeah. 
uh, <laughs> small world, smaller on untapped. I don't know, but that's, uh, that's really right. cool when you kind of see those correlations there. And it, I, this is a great, if I'd have drank this beer two years ago, I wouldn't have liked it as much as I do today. Yeah. It's, uh, these are great notes about it too. A lot of people are getting like rye peppery flavors coming through and stuff. So I'm looking at the Brewer's Bridge beer. Um, yeah, I know, right. It's it, 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 well put, John, it makes the world a little bit smaller. And that was, as I've shared before, another thing I loved about working in the, the, the beer industry is every festival you went to, every event you did, it's kind of like a college reunion. You'd meet, see people you hadn't seen since the last festival, but it's like you saw them yesterday and you kind of pick up where you left off. So untap magnifies that, I think, a bit where you're right able to look in and see what your friends have enjoyed and when they had it and what they thought. And right away, a beer that we didn't know about, you know, a few hours ago, almost feels familiar, both drinking kind of the respective counterparts from different both breweries and then uh, seeing all of our friends uh, whose palates we somewhat trust to uh, definitely trust, depending on who they are, uh, also enjoy it. This has been great. Another cool thing of note, especially as I'm drinking most of my beers at home for the last couple of weeks, uh, after hearing John kind of talk about uh, the quality of uh, or the importance of not just a clean glass, right? Anything mm-hmm. that comes out of your dishwasher is hopefully clean, mm-hmm. uh, but beer clean and how that's a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and I, honestly, uh, I, I'm I'm a nerdy 37 year old beer geek, but I am really excited to uh, get a bottle brush and yeah. uh, some of the uh, um, the the soap because I can't think of the right word for it mm-hmm. right now that he was talking about. Yeah. I'm I'm excited to see what a difference that makes in how my beer pours at home start to resemble the ones I used to get when I'd go out to a beer bar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, likewise. That was something I had a while ago, one of those beer brushes you put in your sink. And I forgot about it until he mentioned and brought it up that it was a thing that we, that I did uh, when, yeah, right, I was kind of more thinking about it. So that's going to go in my Amazon cart next time I make one. Um, but this has been, this has been great kind of going down this, this path of, of Saison's today. And I'm looking forward to this Brewer's Bridge. It's, uh, that'll be real cool. So like I said, report back on it when I get my hands on it. <clears throat> You said you put it on your wish list. Did there, you? yep. Subscribe to it. Yep. That's um, so yeah. So I'll know if anyone else adds it, but I I see the two verify menus close by. I'm gonna kind of grab it from next. I think that's a fairly decent segue into what's going to be our would you rather ah. for this episode, since we well we kind of talked about John a little bit more, and there's some relation here, yeah, Harrison. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask this one to you under no pretense. Um, but the would you rather here is uh, would you rather study to become a master level Cicerone mm-hmm. or study to become a, a master brewer? We'll, <sighs> we'll, we'll, we'll create that position in the world. Yeah. But uh, you kind of understand it's a, a lifetime of learning. Uh, which one would you be? I think which which one would you choose? Right. It's one of those kind of interesting predicaments where I've had friends who are I have friends who are. Uh, advanced Cicerones have gone out for the master Cicerone test and hear them talk about it as a grueling experience is intense, intense to study for this. And then you kind of pry a little bit further into like, well, what do you, okay, what do you study? And yes, it's a lot of reading, but it's also a lot of tasting a lot of beer, a lot of good beer, a lot of bad beer, a lot of off flavors. Like you're learning kind of warts and all what it takes to make a Saison or a stout or, you know, a, a barley wine or whatever it is. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's like, what do you do to study for? You drink a lot of beer. Okay. Well, on a high level, that sounds exciting. Then you kind of get into the nitty gritty and it's like, wait a second, I'm drinking stuff that, you know, was is 10 years old and went bad, you know, nine years ago and I got to try it and, and learn from it. Um, so it can be, um, it could be intense. On the other side, you know, again, it's a master brewer or just being like a commercial brewer, kind of going through that that program. It's much more, um, you know, when you go to brewing school, you learn about the science of brewing. You learn about the engineering of brewing uh, and what how to build a brewery and what pumps do and what vessels do and the kind of practicality of it. But it's almost like the comparison between a, an engineer that builds the car or designs the car and the mechanic that has to fix the car, like being a master brewer, studying to be a, a commercial brewer and then being a brewer, 
It's very, very different. I mean, you find that most of your days as a brewer is fixing broken pumps and mopping the floor, and that's your job. So studying for it, though, it is a lot of going around the world and drinking different beers and going to different breweries and seeing how people do things right. So both of them are are, are appealing. My good friend who runs, now is the director of operations for Cigar City, uh, went to the Civil Brewing Institute in Chicago, and part of his work, part of his schooling was going to Cantillon and brewing with them for like a month. And like all of his pictures from that are just him in these old caves drinking, you know, Cantillon out of barrels with a bunch of people. And it's like, man, that That's the one I picked. Right. I was gonna yeah. say. So, you know, it's 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 hard to choose. I think though, if I'm honest, even though I've worked at kind of, you know, at both levels of this, so professionally, so like I've made the beer and also served the beer, I feel like today, excuse me, what may get me more excited is to dive into the master Cicerone side of things, really kind of, yeah, kind of just just get as nitty gritty as possible about what's in the, the glass. And then as, as, as John said today, it's really about kind of when that beer leaves the brewery, what happens next? So there's a lot of stuff there you learn from from the distribution side, from proper storage, from identifying off flavors. You know, I spent a ton of time messing with, you know, finicky kegs in the basements of many bars around Philadelphia. Perhaps some formal training there would have helped that learning curve be a little less messy and I would have spilled a little less beer trying to figure out why this European Sankey wasn't connecting to this local IPA in my early days, you know, kind of learning on the, on the ropes, if you will. Um, so, uh, so things like that, it, it's exciting to me now, knowing that I've kind of put in the the sweat and the tears to the brewing side to kind of, um, you know, as I spend more time now talking with people who are just people about beer, be nice to, um, yeah, kind of round out that knowledge as opposed to the the stuff I learned, uh, you know, kind of working working behind the scenes, shrouded in darkness, uh doing crazy things in a brewery that uh yeah, this would be this would be more, I guess, um useful for, for where I am today being a master Cicerone. And again, fine, I drink beer with that was brewed with people's yeast that grew in their beards before rogue did a beard beer so i'm okay with the off flavors i can get through that um although just as long as i have preparation as long as i'm mentally aware that would be a rough day to walk in and go oh i'm excited to drink some beer and have it all kind of taste like vinegar that would be a bummer but again you kind of roll with the punches what about you john what are you where are you where is your mind going now as i've laid out all these weird scenarios for us I've I've mainly just been laughing <laughs> um, and fantasizing about drinking beer in yeah, caves. You're right. <laughs> um, but I so the um, the appeal in in being a master brewer is you know being able to come into work and say uh, I know that New England's are trending right now, but we're going to make a tart cherry yep. saison and we're going to blend it with a creek and we're going to age it in my grandmother's old christmas tree barrel Ooh. like being being able to experiment like that and and change the beer landscape has an undying appeal yeah but when i when i look back on it my, one of my favorite jobs was being a i was a bartender in buffalo new york mm-hmm. and aside from the bars being open till 4 a.m <laughs> um it was even uh, not in, in like your typical late night bar. It, it was always just such a rewarding experience when you, know, you get somebody that would come up to your beer and we're two strangers mm-hmm. and they say, man, I, you know, I, I usually drink this when I'm back home. Oh, cool. You'll probably like this one. It's local, but the, it, it should hit. It, it should scratch the itch. Let me know what you think. And then, you know, two seconds later, we're talking about beer and have you ever had this one? And I love that, that friendship and uh, the, the, what, what kind of comes along with uh, being someone's beer I don't want to say teacher, mentor, I'm not mm-hmm. that, but like being someone's friend in beer. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of regard, especially after talking with John, the Cicerones are like the, the watchers on the wall. They're right. like, they're, right. they're, they're, they're for, right. if you're a Game of Thrones fan, <laughs> they're, 
they they take the work that these master brewers have created and their goal is to make sure that it reaches you exactly how it's intended. Um, so like to Harrison's point, when uh, if you've never had to change a European keg into an American keg, you probably would never realize what a giant pain in the butt that is. <laughs> um, and the first time you have to do it, not knowing right. it just ends right. up with beer all over your shoes right. and you talking to your boss and asking not to get fired. Right. Um <laughs> So uh, many times I've cleaned up beer from someone that I uh, that didn't change the the coupler right mm-hmm. or w- whatever. I, I love in a world where more and more people are getting involved in beer that there's also people that are there to make sure the experience is 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 educated or at least try and look after that. Mm-hmm. Um, so of the two, I'm going to drink beer in caves for fun. But which one would I which one would I uh, would I value more in my own personal life today? I think if to be able to say that I understand what a master sister own does, uh, that would make my head explode. Mm-hmm. But that's what I that's what I'd shoot for. Yeah. And in the meantime, I'll work on being a part time at home drinking my beer from a cup sister own <laughs> and a home brewer that probably should take that beer out of the pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> well put. Other than that, um, we did have uh, coming up on the next episode, we talked to uh, Jen, who used to be a host on Tales from the Cast yes. podcast. Um, and I think if, if we if we can play our cards right, she might actually be able to join us on the next upcoming episode. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're listening and you don't know Jen, check out Tales from the Cask. Oh, yeah. Or if you do know Jen, uh, or if you have some feedback, let us know. Uh, you know what what type of segment you'd like to see uh, if we brought Jen on, who knows a lot about beer oh, yeah. distribution. Uh, she her cellar amazing. is amazing. Yep. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Um, so ping us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, untaps official YouTube channel, check out the podcast or leave us a review, uh, if you're up to it, uh, or send Harrison and I a message in the Facebook group. Either way, stay safe. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you again, the notes for this show and the links to the Cicerone program will be available at podcast.untap.com. Connect with us on all of Untapped social media if you have any questions or feedback or connect directly with Harrison and myself at facebook.com slash drinking socially. And we'll see you in two weeks. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>